now. Welcome to this interview um, at the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. I'm talking with Pastor Joy Martinez Marshall of First Baptist here in town. Pastor Joy is from the Colony, Texas. As a young woman, she felt the call to be in ministry. She pursued that call as she attended Baylor University in Waco, Texas, where she received her Bachelor of Arts in Religion. During her undergraduate degree, she served in various ministries, including working with high school students, leading youth mission trips and ministry to children in Guatemala. She her, earned excuse me, her Master of Divinity from George Truett Theological Seminary in Waco, most recently, she served as the student life minister in a Waco congregation. She has a kind husband named Austin. They enjoy watching stand-up comedy, trying restaurants where Guy Fieri has eaten, and cheering on the Liverpool Football Club. It is good to be together. Um, and I should say, Pastor Joy and I have, have uh, uh, shared meals and, and shared ministry in Lincoln the last couple of years as, as both being relatively new um, ministers here in town. Um, so Joy, usually the first question we, we start with is uh, actually a question from neither of our traditions. It's, it's a question from John Wesley. Um, mm -hmm. That is, how are things with your soul these days? I would say uh, my soul today feels relatively calm. Uh, in the morning when I woke up, I was really calm. And then as the day has progressed, it's gotten a little um, rushed. You know, with I am a task oriented person. So sometimes I fall into that trap of how many more things on my list do I have? And how can I do something, write it on the list, and then cross it off just so I can get that satisfaction of drawing that line? And so, sure. yeah, I was, so I was feeling really calm this morning and made breakfast. And then as soon as it hit 11, it, my soul kind of went, I forced my soul to go into um, kind of, rushed mode but i'm glad to be here and chatting and taking time to just stop and have a conversation and get to chat and also get to virtually meet uh the unitarian church in lincoln so i'm excited about that yes indeed yes indeed um so the as we're as we're meeting the unitarian church in lincoln uh so you are the the pastor at first baptist mm -hmm. um and and you go by pastor at First Baptist. I noticed on the, the biography. Is that accurate? Yes. Well, I actually just became a reverend. I was just ordained right. oh. through the yep. American Baptist Church churches of the USA in February. But right. um, the Baptist tradition holds really tightly to the term pastor. And so though I'm officially a reverend, uh, mostly it's just pastor. So uh, I am technically official, which is exciting. And that was a really long journey and road. And uh, when I started the process, I went, I was part of the Methodist tradition before this. And so they have, you know, such a long and extended process, similar to the process you went through. Um, and luckily, since I went to <laughs> Baylor, uh, Capital Baptist USA University and Seminary, it was um, fairly easy to kind of go through the process since the ordaining power lies in the churches and not the denomination. And so I am officially Rev Joy, uh, but no one ever calls me that. They just, <laughs> so that's fine, but. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry I missed that. Um, and I'm, I am sorry that I missed your ordination. Um, I can't remember what was going on that weekend. There were like four different things. I can, it was Super Bowl Sunday. And it was that. Yeah. It, right. Um, it was not um, good planning on my end, but since the Dallas Cowboys were not in the Super Bowl, it was just, it fell on deaf ears. And they uh, haven't been in a while, I think since I was born, maybe, but. <laughs> oh, could be worse. Yeah, that's true. I grew up a Detroit Lions fan, so, you know, we're, the Cowboys have been in a Super Bowl. Fair. And yeah. they won't let it go. Yeah, <laughs> True. That's true. Um, so channeling the question that I know at least a few of my congregants watching this are probably asking it this morning, right now as they're watching. Um, what is ABC? 
what is the distinction between American Baptist and say the Southern Baptist Convention or any of the the various other flavors of of Baptists? Yes. Baptists are unique in the sense of you can find ones you love and you can find ones you really don't like. And so <laughs> the interesting world about being Baptist is each each church is autonomous and so each church governs themselves. And the way that we do denominations or fellowships or conferences or um, conventions, those are all just by choice. And so a church can decide that they want to be a part of one. Um, Texas Baptists are a little different because you can be a part of multiple Baptist fellowships and conventions. But the American Baptists um, is different, very different than the Southern Baptists. They all hold their same history coming from England, uh, mostly from Roger Williams and his settlement in the new colonies, but the road becomes rocky around um, the Civil War. So in 1845, we all had the same heritage, but the American Baptists chose to um, stand against slavery and the Southern Baptists um, did not. And I don't, it actually wasn't until 2003 where they made a formal apology, the Southern Baptist Convention did, for their um, aid and acknowledgement and continual support of the Confederacy. And um, still struggle with that today in different ways. I grew up Southern Baptist, and so I grew up in that tradition. And so when I heard of, I didn't even know the American Baptists existed until I was in college uh, learning in my history classes that focused on Baptist history. And so what the ABC does is they function as um, almost a federation. And so we really just abide up with the denomination and what they do, but they actually have no say or governing over our churches, which is quite interesting. And that's why we run the gamut of um, being very conservative, being very progressive, being moderate, being in the middle. It's kind of just whatever flavor uh, you choose. But the American Baptists have a couple different groups um, couple different associations that um, have aligned together um, for various causes and activism and different things. And so First Baptist Lincoln is in partnership with our American Baptist churches in town, which are Belmont and Second Baptist, uh, but we're all three very unique and very different. And so that's kind of the misconception as all Baptists, you know, they kind of just well, at least in my experience being from the South, it's like, oh, you're all Southern Baptist. And um, especially being a young woman that's uh, become a pastor in a Baptist denomination, it's quite funny because when I go visit home or when I talk to people from back home, they're kind of uh, a little shocked. Because you're serving <laughs> clergy. Yes, serving clergy. And um, the American Baptist has had um, a history of having a female leadership in various kind of portions and seek to be a, a diverse group. Whereas mm -hmm. some of the other Baptist denominations are still, and churches are yep. still very segregated. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting in the, if you did the sort of family tree of either theology or governance, um, the Unitarians and the Baptists are actually not far from each other on governance. We're, we're also technically uh, an association of independent congregations. Um, and so we, we take very, very seriously that the highest authority in our association is, is a group of people in one congregation voting. Uh, yeah. And so our, our, you know, the place that we're ordained is not uh, through a bishop or a hierarchy, but is, is mm -hmm. the local congregation saying we, we ordain this person. And I, I think in that sense, we're still pretty similar mm -hmm. uh, in, in the conception of how our theology gets expressed in, in our organization or lack thereof. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I don't think... I don't think the Unitarian Universalists are big enough to have, have split quite as many times. We always, we always yes. talk about it, but I don't think we've ever done it. 
Yeah, that's one of the hallmarks of being Baptist and kind of a, a joke that is not funny and or funny, if you do find it funny, is if you don't like that Baptist church, just go to the one down the street and, and you'll probably like that one or get along. And, or um, the other funny joke is if you didn't like what someone brought to the potluck, um, split the church. You know, it's kind of this um, sad reality, but this kind of funny expression of acknowledging that we have have failed to maintain unity um, in, in the Baptist world, but that's why people hold so tight to their Baptist tradition is the um, autonomy to split and the priesthood of all believers, which means that there's an understanding that each person in the congregation has access, has knowledge, um, and a way to interpret and speak and talk about um, the Bible in our tradition. Sure. Um, so you are from and have spent much of your life in Texas, mm -hmm. and you are now uh, a minister in Nebraska. Yes. So how'd that happen? Well, it was kind of a new, well, I'll show you. I wore my Texas shirt today <laughs> to, uh, to be kind of obnoxious. So one thing that I've noticed is I was born and raised in Texas in uh, the colony, which is a suburb of Dallas and then lived um, the majority of my young adult life in Waco, Central Texas. Sure. And so there is such a deep-seated pride and just obnoxious flavor of being a Texan. And so what I find funny is I moved to a state that also has this pride of being Nebraska and, you know, this saying of Nebraska nice. Mm -hmm. But in Nebraska, people are so kind about it. And like, oh, it's just, I'm honored to be a Nebraskan. And in Texas, it's like, we exist alone. And, you know, we were our own um, country, briefly. Sure. And so people still cling to that. Like, Baylor University was founded under the Republic of Texas. So my diplomas say, chartered under the Republic of Texas. I mean, and that's been years, guys. It's been a long time. <laughs> but there's still that kind of interesting sense but when I uh, was in seminary, I knew I wanted to work in a different position. I loved working with students, but I felt like that really wasn't um, my gifting or what I wanted, what I was called to do long term. So I started applying to churches, um, predominantly Baptist churches in um, the South. And so I applied to about 20 churches and then <clears throat> I got into a brief spat with our job placement person. We exchanged some words and he hooked me up with our regional minister, our assistant regional minister for our region in, here in Nebraska. And I just talked to him on the phone and he asked me, you know, what's your story? What would you like to do? And so I just blabbed for a really long time and said, this is what, this is how I've come to understand uh, my faith. And this is what I would like to do in a church setting. And he said, huh, you'd be a really good fit for a First Baptist Lincoln. Have you thought about that? And I said, um, honestly, no, I didn't really think about that one. He said, I'm gonna meet with their community or their congregation this weekend. Do you mind if I give them your resume? I said, sure, why not? And so it was kind of this irony in these different things. Each time I had an interview with him, I'd go out and I'd go tell Austin, I'd say, well, uh, we'll be cut this round. So don't get your hopes up. You know, we're not going to make it to the next one. And we'd keep making it through these rounds. And um, Austin was invited to be a part of the interview process. And so it was this unique thing of once visiting, knowing that this was going to be home and knowing that we were going to be called here, but just such a roundabout way. Um, the Baptist tradition, they take a vote. So they invite you to come, you know, preach and then yep. they vote on you and, you know, you go to the room and wait. Yep. We're the same. That, okay, good. That a fun day. <laughs> yes. Yes. So we are waiting in the room and we just kind of laughed and said, never ever would we think about ever moving to Nebraska. But um, we think that God is pretty funny. And so we just kind of laughed and said, well, we'll see how this goes. You know, hopefully we get voted here. And so it has been exciting to be in Nebraska. I still, unfortunately, do have some of my gross Texan pride. It's kind of impossible 
to get out of you. You know, we have a cookie cutter that's in the shape of Texas. Yep. Um, there's tortilla chips, different things like <laughs> that are shaped like Texas. Really, um, I have a pan that's shaped like Texas. I'm not proud of that one, but that was a gift. Yep. Uh, but the moving was um, such a shock. I had moved, of course, from my hometown um, to Waco, but my husband had never moved ever. He had lived, born, raised, bred in Waco. And so when we moved, it was a very big step for us. Uh, but it's been exciting and uh, pretty far from home. I think it's like a 13 hour drive, a short flight, but <laughs> a long drive. Yeah. So now after, um, let's see, you were, you were called and it's been about a year now. No, way. it's actually just been like seven months. But don't worry, uh, time, has, yeah, <laughs> yeah. time has kind of stood still. I, I read something earlier and it said, are, is this April 84th today? I'm, yeah. It's kind of has been. Yeah, so, well, it's been one congregational year. Like you, you began oh. in the fall and, and yes. yeah. Um, how, after seven months or, you know, whatever it is, how, how have you come to understand your, your faith and calling to, to Nebraska, to this particular church? Um, I've seen, so in the beginning, I was quite skeptical. You know, I was nervous. I had some anxiety about uh, moving. I had never had a position as the senior minister. And at this church, the, the only minister, um, paid minister, uh, on our bulletin, it says, ministers and then it, um, below it says all members of the congregation so nice kind of, oh that's lovely <laughs> yeah it's kind of this nice reminder um, but I had never been in a position like this and so I was quite nervous um, but once we moved the congregation just embraced us in such a beautiful way and um, became our family and uh, have just stepped in and filled in the gaps in different ways but also have just encouraged us so much so much that it has been this ongoing kind of revelation of um, each time something new happens or I experience something, I feel um, as if uh, God is faithful to show me in, in that time that this is where I'm supposed to be. And mm. one of the unique challenges of being a, a young minister, so First Baptist, I am um, the first, I think I'm the youngest pastor they've ever had and the first female pastor that they've ever called to be their ex uh, senior minister. And so with that, of course, my age had always become kind of a joke, like, you know, <clears throat> never, never in an unkind way, but they'd be like, oh, you're so young. When I had my birthday, they're like, I can't believe you're still in your, your 20s. But God, uh, through this kind of process of isolation and going online, right. uh, someone <laughs> in one of our congregants called me this weekend and we were talking and she said, I'm just really glad you're young because this technology stuff is a lot. And I said, I'd like to, I'd like for you to share that uh, during church time <laughs> or could I have that in writing? Yeah. So I've kind of been through this, this weird process that um, God has really made it known that I've um, been called here for a unique reason and uh, kind of a unique time that we're all experiencing. And of course it's not, a time of jubilee or excitement, but it's been really crucial to kind of have some skills that I, you know, started learning in fifth grade when I took typing class and, right. and different things. And so that, uh, just that small experience, well, big experience has showed me along with the small ones that Nebraska is now home and that we'll just have to get used to going to multiple stores uh, for grocery lists. I think, I think I had complained to you and uh, you about that that's like I feel like you there's so many different places to go like you want to go I want to go get produce at fresh time mm -hmm. I want to get the frozen orange chicken from Trader Joe's <laughs> I want to get my like normal stuff somewhere else so I think we're just kind of getting used to it and um, we feel like we're home now so that has been really really a blessing and we're grateful that the winter was not harsh uh, yeah. Uh, allegedly it felt yeah. like it was this is, the, this is the easiest one i've been here for um, <laughs> yes uh 
I don't know if that's good because it's not going to get any easier than this one that we just had. Yes. Well, you know, maybe in the next couple of years. Um, you know, it, it is, it's, it's, uh, it's strange. I keep hearing, mm, I keep hearing from people and that is a terrible sentence to say to to any minister i keep hearing from people but i keep hearing this this idea that nebraska is sort of has its own culture and is in and there's a distinction between people that are from nebraska and have always been here and and those of us who have recently moved here but one of the things that's been very true for stacy and i is just how quickly we've gone from sitting in our apartment in the Bronx, looking at each other being like, oh my God, we might move to Nebraska. <laughs> to, to a short time later, I mean, within a year, sitting in our house in Lincoln being like, I, I can't imagine anywhere else that we would live. Like th this, is, this is clearly home for us and it will be for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and and that 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 transition happened really fast and in a remarkable way, because um, mm -hmm. it is not uh, as as I assume is also true uh, coming from Texas. It is not a place that uh, that I spent a whole lot of time in seminary contemplating moving to. Um, yeah. I I I thought from my tradition like oh what would it look like to move to the Boston area or what would it look like to move to the West Coast or what would it look like. <laughs> Maybe I kind of assumed I'd end up in the mid-Atlantic, you know, in, in Virginia, North Carolina. Um, but Nebraska was, <laughs> Nebraska was a surprise. Yes. Well, we had a bunch of friends, not to um, name names, my mom. She thought that she didn't know where it was geographically for yeah. like a moment. She was like, okay, isn't it right above Oklahoma? Well, there's another state there. <laughs> and so it became kind of a running joke with our friends when we, when I applied, um, yep. that it'd be like, oh yeah, you'll become a, you'll move to Nebraska. And we kind of just laughed it off. But um, ironically enough, my mother was born in Omaha. Oh, really? Uh, yes. On an, uh, the army base there back in the day. And so she was born in Omaha doesn't remember her time there. And then the funny part is my dad works for Nebraska Furniture Mart in Texas. They just, they opened one in Texas in my hometown. And so my dad works there. And so it was kind of like, it was like, wow, um, this is very silly and funny that we've kind of come full circle in a way, um, and, but never had any ties. I mean, Austin's dad grew up in Oberlin, Kansas. And so he went to, um, McCook to the Walmart. So Austin's been to Nebraska before, um, to the Walmart in McCook twice, three times. And so it, it was really odd for us uh, because our extended families lived in the Waco area mm -hmm. to just get up and, and move to Nebraska. But like you guys, it, it does, it does feel like home now. And it's like, man, I, I don't know what I'd be doing back in the 105 degree heat. I don't know what I'd be doing now that Texas is reopening. <laughs> and so it's kind of um, a very weird thing, but it's been so fun uh, to be in Nebraska and to transition here and to, to move here and embrace all of the interesting things like chili and cinnamon rolls. <laughs> and <laughs> the rest is off 18th fried chicken. That's really what. Oh, that's we're good at. stuff. That's, <laughs> yes. That's our neighborhood. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, so we are in the midst of a pandemic at the moment. Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the reasons that, uh, that we're having this conversation in this way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering for you, uh, and, and we can take this in a couple of directions, but either, you know, how, how has it been ministering in the pandemic? Because this is... Mm -hmm jobs have changed rapidly and unexpectedly um or aside from the the job of it what are some what are some questions that you keep coming back to during this time 
Um, I don't know if, if either of those questions or, or one of them uh, yeah. speak to you, but. Sorry, I'm having some, aller some eye itching allergy stuff here. Uh, I would say pastoring in a pandemic um, has been stressful because I am still really new to this job and this position. So it's been a unique challenge, which I'm sure you've experienced as well. And it's really forced and encouraged a lot of creativity, mm -hmm. which has, I think, have been a really beautiful thing um, to come out of this. Just different uh, faith communities, different groups, different uh, nonprofits, different things that have just kind of adapted in such interesting and fun ways. That's been really exciting um, mm -hmm. to watch. It has been a challenge with the congregation getting everyone either. Uh, receiving something in the mail or receiving something via email and different things. Um, I think one of the, there's two questions I really have feel drawn to and that the first one is uh, maybe from the Christian tradition and it's how do you love God and neighbor during this time? And so how can I love my neighbor? And so I can wear a mask, I can stay home, different things of really embracing and encouraging that. And reminding mm -hmm. people um, that people are always more important than profit, that right. people are lives matter more than other things. And so um, that has been something that I just keep coming back to day to day. And then my second one is how to create community virtually. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you've experienced that as well, I'm sure, is it's yeah. a, a challenge and the great thing about the internet is you can find community in different ways, but I guess how do you continue to foster that without it feeling like the same thing every week? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if this if this resonates at all with you, but but for me, one of the puzzles um, has been, you know, I'm I'm a millennial. Um, I, I'm probably a couple, I'm in my mid thirties. So I've, I've got a couple of years in this conversation, yeah. but not much. Like I'm, I'm still in that digital native cohort. And one of the things for me that's been curiosity provoking in this time um, is if you'd asked me a year ago to describe church's relationship with technology, I would have said something like this. We spend a lot of time in front of screens in our lives. And church is one of the places that tries to, to get us to, to have meaningful connections and experiences that are, that are tangible, that we sit in a sanctuary, that we break bread, literally break bread together, mm -hmm. that, we, um, that we listen and we sing together. And that's really important, even for, for my millennial self, and in, in some ways mm -hmm. more so for millennials, because we're so online that, that uh, at least for me, there's been some, I've felt pushback against that. My mm -hmm. congregation mocks me because I have a turntable in my office. And, you know, I can, mm -hmm. I can look up any song that I want on, on Spotify, but sometimes I want to just pull out uh, a Josh Ritter album and put it on. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I would have said a year ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now um, we're in this moment where the, the distinction between our digital lives and our, and our religious lives is there is no distinction anymore. Mm -hmm. They have to be the same thing for a while. We have to be, we have to be figuring out ways to, sing together, to do ritual together, to preach together, to sit with each other, to, to do coffee hour, all separated by pixels and, and miles. Um, it's fascinating to, to think through how to do that meaningfully and authentically. Um, yes, and even to think about um, the discrepancies that technology has within your socioeconomic class. Um, right. We have uh, multiple people that don't have access to the internet um, 
but have a smartphone, but then to ask them to stream something is just eating up your data. Right. And uh, so it's become a, a real challenge. I, I feel like working with students, I tried to incorporate some technology, but very much like you, I, uh, as the millennial, it was like, put your phones down during youth time. You know, it's 15 minutes out of the week. And it, it, you just hark on that. We pass around a basket. We'd encourage to try to disconnect for an evening. But now it's the technology has become a lifeline for some that have it. And so now it's, well, how can we reach out um, to different people? So we, we've attempted to do a call tree, which has been an interesting experience has been a challenge, but has been really exciting because people that normally would not chat have started to chat. Uh, and being new, it's I've been able to get to know people on a deeper level because we've just chatted on the phone. Yeah. Um, so that has been a lot of fun. But it is that question of how to do the rituals and the symbols and the different things. And you know, um, and the Christian communion is so up close and, and personal. And so now it's, <laughs> I'm thinking about for next month, I'm going to make communion packs with like right. grape soda mix and saltines and package them. But didn't you have a drive have to communion take at First Baptist last month? <laughs> yeah, what? Didn't you have a drive through communion last yes. month? Yes, I did. We um, packaged everything with masks and gloves on. But the funny thing was we could only find, we looked for like little plastic, like condiment containers, but Russ's, um, we also live in the neighborhood next to Russ's, only had shot glasses, like plastic shot glass cups. So I packaged the communion in those. And some of our um, folks that came, they took communion and they said, this is so odd. We've never done anything like this before. And I said, well, I hate to tell you this, I hope you're not a dry Baptist because you just took it out of a, a shot glass. <laughs> and so there is kind of a, a playful element, but it has been really challenging to make sure people are feeling the connection that you get from being in person. And of course, technology cannot, I, I don't think it can replace that, right. um, but it's necessary right now for this time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we do a Thursday night vespers service and and our we don't have a phone tree in quite the same way but it's all it's a zoom room so we have like 50 or 60 people on a zoom call and then every every week we we put people into breakout rooms that they are randomly assigned to um and so they have 20 minutes with about four other people from the congregation just to check in on the week but it's it's a different group every week um my sense is sometimes those get those are not great conversations and sometimes they become really deep, rich check-ins with folks that you might not otherwise have, have had a chance to connect with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that, uh, that random assignment is something that I, I wonder about if there's a way to replicate that when we do go back in person to be like at coffee hour, maybe instead of hanging out with the same 10 people every week, like how, how can we, yeah shuffle around our our uh our coffee hour room and randomly assign groups of five to check in with each other um who knows um it is a fascinating time to be doing ministry i don't know i th i don't know that we're going to go back to to what we were doing in january um yeah, we, we've been asking three questions that were suggested to us uh, by the ABC USA, by kind of the general secretary's office. And those three questions are, um, what are you going to stop as a congregation? What are you going to start? And what are you going to strengthen? And so really mm -hmm. taking this time to think about what are some things that we do as a church, as a congregation, as people? that really does need to stop that we've seen does not, you know, right. is not um, helpful or conducive or encouraging. And then what are things that we've started doing that we can continue? Um, so is that like doing interview styles like this to get people engaged 
uh, to have people join the discussion. And then what can we strengthen? What are things that we really, really missed that we really want to kind of jump back into? So those have been the questions we've been asking, but I think you're right. It's not going to go back to this normal. I mean, it's going to be familiar because of our, the people, we know them, the rituals, the symbols, the practices, but life is different now. You know, we're going to, when we eventually go back, we'll be asking people to wear face coverings. We'll be asking right. people to sit in between, you know, in separate pews to enter and exit different things. And so it, it is a unique time. Um, but with that, I've kind of said to our group that I never, ever want to hear the excuse. We haven't done that before um, because now there's no justification. We haven't done any of this before, right. which is a, a unique exciting opportunity but it was a real challenge because there is no metric there's no rubric there's no kind of guide to how to transition back right right well because the corollary i mean that, that i've said it's come up in a couple of these interviews is that nobody right now can say we've always done it this way mm -hmm. like no we haven't yeah. <laughs> we are making it up as we go along um so on on a lighter note um i i did notice in your bio um and i think i remember from con from conversations with austin that, that the two of you are liverpool fans um my understanding is that that season ended with liverpool in striking distance of a championship in the first for the first time in a while Yes. So Liverpool had been doing, and I'm sure Austin might see this and he's going to just maybe vomit about my lack of understanding because we do watch every game. Um, but I've recently downloaded TikTok. Well, I guess before this. And so I've been not paying attention during the games. And so they were doing so well. And then they lost a couple of the international matches right before the shutdown. And so my question to him was do you think that will help that they can kind of regroup or do you think they're just going to take those loss those couple losses and is that going to affect them but they but they're such a strong team and one thing that has been giving me so much joy during this lockdown is they've been posting their zoom calls and so on instagram you can go watch like their zoom calls and they're just such a funny group you know they're a team and i I played sports, my brothers played sports, Austin did, and so that camaraderie and those jokes, it's like um, they have the clowns on the team that are always messing. The manager is like always kind of rolling his eyes. He's always a uh, clop, his name is clop, and so he always gets frustrated. So we have been really missing those games because they've become something um, special to us with Saturday being you know, one of the only off days that we can watch and waking up early you know 10 9 to watch the games <laughs> has been something that has been really special to kind of our routine here so it's been adjusted it's been odd but i hope they can bring it back we were so i grew up only a, an american football fan in my family and we are unfortunately still dallas cowboys fans growing up in dallas and so when I started dating Austin, he was really interested in soccer. And one of my brothers, he became interested in soccer around the same time. And so, of course, to bond with both of them, I just started subscribing to every ESPN soccer report <laughs> on there. I had no idea that there was the Premier League, the Spanish League, the Italian League, the German League, and then, you know, the championship and the other leagues in England. And so I have come to learn, but I am pretty upset that the the season is canceled, uh, but I'm glad it is, of course, for safety reasons I mean, for the spectators, but just one of those, you know, just one of those weird things that I find myself grieving during this time that in the scheme of reality is, is not important, <laughs> but it's just that petty little thing that I'm like, oh, I wish I could see if Bobby, I'm a big Bobby Firmino fan. Right. Um, because I love that he goes by Bobby. I think that that's hilarious. And, uh, and a huge uh, Salah fan. So I uh, have just been following them on, on social media like a, like a um, creep. But 
I hope that next season they can bring it back and, yeah. and win, win, of course, the league again, because I, I do not like Tottenham. I don't want any success for them. Uh, you can come for me in the comments, but that's how I feel. So, you know, my sister is a big Tottenham fan. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm just, we're going to just move right along. There. Yes. <laughs> well, whenever they play each other, I call it the battle of the chickens. Yep. Because, like, neither that's wants weird. to admit that they're chickens. <laughs> and so Austin usually gets upset. But what we normally do is, like, buy a nugget tray or <laughs> buy ch chicken to celebrate the game because I have, I call it the battle of the chickens. Yep. Yep. Uh, for anybody interested, if you go online and just look up the, the, uh, the logos of Liverpool Football Club and Tottenham, they are spectacular chickens. Yes. Uh, and very literal. Um, yeah, it's, it's sports are hard. This is supposed to be the beginning of baseball season. Mm -hmm. Our minor league team here in Lincoln is starts up in late May and I guess not minor league. Um, they're independent league. Let me get that right. <laughs> oh, okay. And they are, can you remind me of the name? I'm, I'm sorry. For, they are the Lincoln Salt Dogs. Okay, okay. Um, yep. And it's right about this time is when we usually get excited to, to start going to games. Because right about this time is, is the time when the Baltimore Orioles season has usually created. <laughs> um, and they're already out of playoff contention in early May. And so I just switch over to, to the local team. But uh, that hasn't happened yet. The Orioles are still on top of the American League. Um, they're yeah. uh, tied for first, along with every other team in baseball. Yes, I know the Rangers fans have been upset because they were supposed to debut and open their new stadium. Yeah. And that's not happening. So well, just have, have to wait it out. Well. I mean, the Orioles stadium has been so empty the last couple of years that, that they're going to be fine with social distance. Oh, good. <laughs> I'll just say our usual 8,000 fans in a 40,000 person stadium. We'll just, we'll keep doing that. <laughs> um, oh, well. It has been lovely to catch up with you um, and, and, uh, and to have some time to chat and just take a break from all the little pieces that, that need to get done. Um, I do need to go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have to go be with the daughter and somewhere in there, finish my annual report and somewhere in there do a couple other things. But um, thank you so much for this time. Um, and uh, any, any last thoughts for the, the gathered before we turn off the camera here oh just a thank you to you for inviting me and thank you for letting me um, participate it's been fun to uh, get to know you and, and your family and exciting that uh making new friends and in, in different ways and keeping it uh alive and fresh it's been a lot of fun so thank you for that thank you so much for your time um has been joy martinez and oscar sinclair for first baptist in lincoln and the unitarian church in lincoln um, have a lovely evening and we will see you around soon.